Is the last stop in Yuma County a deadly one? Let's talk about it now. Hey everyone, it's David Stark from Launcher Pass. And I'm here to talk to you about The Last Stop in Yuma County, which is coming to theaters on May 10th, 2024. It is a new Western thriller from writer and director Francis Gallopi. I think it's his first feature film. And oh my gosh, it's a really good one. My hot take is I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. I definitely think you should watch it. It is just a tense Western thriller with a fantastic cast, really great sense of style, and some big surprises along the way. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a really well done film. It's fairly simple, but I love the simplicity. I love just kind of like the attention to detail that the film had. It is just a, a treat. And so I definitely think you should check it out when it comes to theaters on May 10, 2024. So all that being said, I'm going to tell you a little about the film, a few things I liked, a few things I didn't like, and then really quickly go into the ending. So as you can imagine, there'll be spoilers in the ending section. If you don't want to know what happens in this movie, and you might not, there are some big surprises that happen along the way. I would turn it off when I get to the ending. Before that, though, I'll keep it vague. I'll keep it spoiler free. I'll let you know when I get to those spoilers. So in the last stop in Yuma County, it involves the last stop in Yuma County, as you would imagine. You have a nice salesman who is traveling back to go see his daughter for her birthday, and he runs low on gas. So he pulls into the last gas station for about 100 miles, and unfortunately, it is out of gas. They're dry. They're waiting for the new truck to come. But until that comes, they don't have any gas, and there's really nowhere else for him to go. So he has to go pull up into the diner next door to wait out and try to get, uh, you know, try to wait for some gas. But... When some other visitors start coming into this diner, things get a little bit more unsettling and possibly a little more dangerous for everyone involved. So, all that being said, things I liked about this movie. The first, the cast. The cast is fantastic. It's a great cast. You've got just an ensemble cast. I love Jim Cummings as the knife salesman. Richard Brake was fantastic as one of those uh, sinister guests. Barbara Crampton made an appearance a little bit short for my taste. I love Barbara Crampton. I wanted her more stuff, but she had a small role in this film. Uh, Sierra McCormick was great as uh, one of the other diner visitors. And Jocelyn Donahue uh, was fantastic as like the, the waitress, the person that is kind of like trying to keep all the chaos in order. It is just a really phenomenal cast of very interesting characters, and they all kind of come together in this diner as this uh, tense situation starts to boil. The uh, second thing I loved, I love the music. It has both great, like sinister, tense, like cello music at the start to really let you, to really keep you on edge while you're wondering what's going to happen next. And it also has some like older music to kind of fit with the style, which is the next thing I'm going to go into. The uh, third thing I loved, I love the style. It definitely feels like an older kind of like Western movie. And you get that at, from the start, like from the very beginning, you get this like, old time looking Welgo USA logo, which I love. Like I see a lot of Welgo USA films. I love that company. And this was a very different one. And it was really fun to see kind of a, a I don't know, classic take on the Welgo logo. And that translates also into the film itself. The, uh, the text is like bright yellow and looks like something from, I don't know, I don't know the time period, like a 1960s movie, I assume some, somewhere around there. And it definitely kind of fits the overall theme. This does feel like a movie that is maybe trying to like call back to a different time. And it definitely shows. And the last thing I love, I love the turn. I'll call it the turn or maybe like the, the climax of the movie. It was really well done. Like I said, you're waiting for this tension to happen. You're waiting for this buildup to happen. And when it does actually happen, it is pretty surprising and shocking. So, you know, what? one more thing. The last thing I loved, I did love the ending asterisk uh i liked the ultimate ending i thought it fit with kind of the themes and things that are happening in this film and the decisions that were made so i think it is a good classic thriller type of ending and i think it's very well done so all that being said things i didn't love as much i, I don't know i don't know how to really describe it the ending feels a little bit unfulfilling and I'm, that's not that's a tough thing for me to talk about i'll talk about it more in the ending section but it almost feels like this movie had a set plot and then they kind of extended it out maybe they i don't know if that's this is the way i'm mean, gonna I'll ask the director when i talk to him this is maybe this is the way it was always supposed to be but it feels like there is a natural end point to this movie and then it kind of keeps going and that's not to say that the later stuff i didn't you know like but it does feel like this movie could have stopped but kind of keeps going and it makes it kind of almost drag on in, in a weird way um and the ultimate ending is a little bit unfulfilling for reasons I will talk about in the ending section. So all that being said, I really did enjoy Last Stop in Yuma County. It was a very fun movie for me to see. It was kind of a refreshing breath of fresh air. So 
I definitely think you should check it out when it comes to theaters on May 10th, 2024. And I'm going to go to the ending right now. So if you don't know what happens in this movie, and you probably don't, there are some big surprises. I would turn it off uh, now because there will be spoilers. So in the last stop in Yuma County, you have a traveling knife salesman, like I said, who runs out of gas. He stops at this gas station. It's the last gas station for like 100 miles. He's going home to see his daughter. And the, the station is also out of gas. They're bone dry. And so he has to wait in this diner. And while he's pulling up, there is this radio uh, broadcast. Remember the radio? That was a thing that people used to have to, to listen to. Well, there was a radio broadcast about uh, these bank robbers that uh, stole $700,000 from a bank and were getting away in a green Pinto with a dent in the back. And like, okay, that's weird. This is definitely not a green Pinto. So it's not this knife salesman. So he goes in and waits at the diner for the gas truck to show up and for him to finally be able to fill up in gas. Now, he talks to the waitress. They you know, have, have a little bit of chit chat. He gets coffee and some pie for his daughter to bring to his daughter because he's going home to see her for her birthday. And then a little bit later, a green Pinto pulls up with a dent on the back and some rough looking individuals, most notably Richard Brake, who was fantastically sinister in this movie. They go to the diner as well. They need gas. There is no gas, so they go into the diner also. Now, you find out pretty early on that these are the bank robbers, and they just want to keep moving on. They don't want to stay here. They don't want to be stuck, but what are they going to do? The gas station has no gas. Uh, the knife salesman has no gas, which they kind of like deduce because he's waiting there. Uh, the motel next door, the owner doesn't have a car, and the uh, waitress, her husband dropped her off, so she doesn't have a car either. So they decide to wait also until the, the gas truck comes or someone comes that they can take their car from. Now, Early on, the knife salesman notices the green pinto, notices these two individuals that look a little bit kind of scary. And and during a pitch, she wanted him to like do his knife salesman pitch on her. Uh, he brings up that these people look very similar to the bank robbers. And the waitress is like, oh, well, let me call my husband, who is the sheriff. He's like, no, no, not yet. Like, just wait. Uh, eventually, she does go to call her husband. And that is when the bank robbers get suspicious. They head over there and they take these people hostage. They cut the phone line. They take uh, the waitress and, and the nice salesman hostage. They are holding them, basically, you know, waiting until the gas comes. But unfortunately for the bank robbers, more and more people come. And this begins, like, a slew of different people. An old couple comes in. Uh, you've got uh, one of the deputies from the police station comes in to get some coffee because the police station is out of coffee. And the waitress tries to, like, send a message. But that gets bumbled uh, due to circumstances. You've got... Um, a Native American who lives in the area who comes in for some lunch. You have a, a brash couple who come in. That was that was this couple, Sybil and Miles. Sybil is played by uh, Sierra McCormick. And they pull up to the gas station and they notice that the green Pinto is there. And they recognize that this must be the bank robber's car. And so Miles, thinking that he can maybe get a big score, tries to pry open the car because he wants the money in there. You can't pry open the trunk. So they go in to try to figure out whose car it is and maybe see if they can like get in on the deal. So you have this group of random people all in the diner. Now, when this um when this in this uh Native American shows up, he's a town local. Um Bo, who's played by Richard Brake, he's one of the bank robbers, goes up to him and asks if he had enough gas to get home, if like if he filled up, just kind of like making small talk. And he's like, Yes, I, I filled up yesterday. Which seems to be the catalyst. The bank robbers have all been waiting for someone to show up that can move them along. Everyone else that showed up had run out of gas and were waiting for the gas station to kind of like start up. Well, this is the catalyst. Uh, Bo goes and like puts a quarter in the jukebox, starts a song, and then takes Charlotte, the, the waitress, hostage. And this pulls turns into a wonderful standoff because when he takes her hostage, the other bank robber pulls out a gun and puts it on the Native American guy. The old couple, they had a gun, so they pull out a gun, and he's holding it on one of the bank robbers, and the Native American guy pulls out a gun, too. He's, he's holding it on one of the bank robbers, and then Miles, who wants to get in on the score, pulls out a gun, and he's pointing it at the Native American trying to make a deal. And so they have this really long standoff where they go back and forth on what they're going to do. Uh, the Native American guy's like, hey, just, like, take my take my uh, truck. Like, I don't care. You can you can take it. Just let her go. And they're like, like no, no, we're going to keep her as collateral. And he's like, no, you leave her. You can have my truck. They all have this long standoff. And eventually, the, the old man who has a gun trained on one of the bank robbers notices that Charlotte has a knife. She grabbed a knife from the back. She put it in her, like, uh, apron. And so she pulled it out. And he's like, go for it. And so she stabs Bo in the leg. He's holding her hostage, which causes him to let her go. Charlotte falls. Causes, you know, gunfire everywhere, uh, you know, 
Bo gets shot in the neck. Uh, the other bank robber like gets down. He shoots the uh, the Native American guy. Um, everyone get everyone gets shot in various ways. It's, it's chaos except for three people. The larger, more brash bank robber he survives. He doesn't get shot. The knife salesman fell under you know went under the table for cover. He didn't get shot. And Sybil didn't get shot either. Now, the brass bank robber notices Sybil, notices that she's, you know, alive still, and tries to go over there to stop her. And while he's, like, got a gun trained on her, the, the motel owner, who's next door, pops him with a shotgun. He heard the commotion, came running with his shotgun, pops the accomplice with a shotgun, but he gets shot by Bo. So now, you have Bo, who is, like, critically injured. He's got, he was shot in the neck. He's, like, bleeding out. You have the knife salesman, and you have Sybil. You're like, okay, well, this is okay. Everything will be fine. Sybil grabs a gun and points at the knife salesman. And she's like, you know, I want that money. And he's like, you can have it. Like, I, I, you know, well, A, you should, like, call the police. You shouldn't take the money. You don't want it. But when she insists, he's like, you can have it. Like, to have the money, take it. But she doesn't want any witnesses. She doesn't want anyone to know that she has the money. So eventually, after some more tense standoff, she shoots at the knife salesman. It like hits the table that he's hiding under, and this causes her to like freak out and like drop the gun. And that is when he runs at her. He's a knife salesman. He was preparing to defend himself. He had a knife and he plunges it into her chest. Just in time. He was reacting. She was gonna kill him. Okay, everything is fine. Well, not fine, but you know, at the moment, everything has seems to be settled. Now, unfortunately, that conversation planted a little seed in the knife salesman and Seems like now he wants a little bit of that money. He wants that score. So as he's smoking, trying to figure out what to do, he decides, you know what? I'm going to take this money. So he goes inside to get the key. He gets the painter. And this is this is where like the natural ending kind of felt like. It felt like it could have been an ending here. Like everyone was dead. The situation was handled. But now the knife salesman kind of going against what I kind of got as his character. His character was, you know, fairly good the entire time. Uh, you know, he, he did kill someone, but that was definitely in self-defense. Now he kind of turns. He seems like he now wants to get that money. And I, I, I understand this is an important, I think this is an important point of the movie, like what happens next. But it did feel weird that you had this like perfect natural progression, like natural ending. And then it kind of kept going. It kind of almost felt like it dragged on. So the nice salesman goes inside, gets the keys to the Pinto, gets the, gets the cash out of the Pinto, puts it in his car, but his car has no gas. Well, the Native American guy had gas. So he has to go get like a hose, get some gas cans, siphon out the hose from the truck and as he's doing this he's getting ready to fill up his own car he's filling up his own car getting ready to leave and that is when he sees a new couple pull up a brand new random couple pulls up to the gas station they don't have all the information they're new so they go in you know they go into the diner trying to figure out what's happening the nice salesman like goes and hides behind the diner and the husband sees the carnage comes out like tell her to call the police the nice salesman doesn't want this. He doesn't want any witness. He doesn't want anyone to know. So he pops up with a gun, tells him, no, 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 stop. You know, don't do that. Don't do that. And he's like, I'm good. I'm not, I'm not a bad guy. Just don't do that. They're understandably concerned. They don't really trust this person with a gun when they have just seen a like massacre in the diner. And so he tries to tell them like, Hey, like you take, you know, I'll give you $10,000 to just drive away. You never saw me. You were never here. And they consider it. But then the, the wife is like, well, that's, you know, that, that, that's that's dirty money like we don't want to be involved in this and so eventually in or trying to like push this along the nice salesman puts the gun in the air and pulls the trigger and click nothing nothing happens and the husband gets really annoyed at this he's like you sob and he lunges at him and while when he lunges at him uh the nice salesman you know involuntarily pulls the trigger on the gun and it goes off while shooting the the new shooting the new couple's wife and this obviously causes him to be angry. He starts to like fight the knife salesman and he, the knife salesman like punches back and eventually grabs a tire iron that was nearby and whacks the husband in the face. So what started off as a, you know, one death kind of self-defense. Now it's moved on to another thing. Like the wife of the new couple wasn't like necessary. Like it was it kind of involuntary, but, but he still made that situation happen. And now he also just like, killed the husband as well and during the the altercation with the husband he the knife salesman was going for the gun and it went off again and shot under the car so you're like okay that's not going to be good but 
He's taking these two people out. There are no more witnesses. And then he hears a baby crying. And he looks inside the car that had just pulled up, this new couple, and there's a young baby in there. So it goes from bad to worse. Like now, not only is he responsible for like killing the parents, that baby is potentially going to die. I think he's, but he's made his decision. He's already gone too far. So he gets in his car and drives away. Now, remember when that, uh, that gun shot under the car? Well, it seems to have hit a fuel line of some sort. Didn't blow up, but it hit a fuel line. And now the car is leaking gas as he's driving away. So what seems like maybe a, a perfect escape might not be so perfect. Now the sheriff decides he's finally going to show up. And the sheriff and the deputy were there. The deputy was there earlier. The sheriff uh, was there to drop his wife off at the very start of the movie. But he hasn't been there since. He hasn't heard from his wife. He had a conversation with her. She got cut off. They've been trying to call. No one has picked up. So he's like, you know what? I'm going to go over there and see what's going on. And the sheriff's like receptionist was Barbara Crampton. She was wonderful, but she had like only a few lines. I was a little, I was a little sad that she didn't have more, but it's fine. Like she did a great job. Now the sheriff and the deputy pull up, they get to this carnage and he runs in and sees his dead wife and just like cradles her. Like he is distraught. This was, I think it was going to be like their 17 year wedding anniversary, like some big anniversary. He comes in this massacre, sees his wife dead. And now he like is very upset. And you know, again, he goes and like cradles his wife. He's destroying evidence. Like she was in a position and now he's like picking her up. I mean, I, you know, emotionally he was not in a great place, but he should have been taken off the case and maybe the deputy should have investigated. It's fine. It, it was a good emotional scene. Now, when they realize that the bank robbers are here, he goes and like tr opens the Pinto. There's no money in there. And he sits down next to the Pinto, just like wondering what to do. And he smells gas and he sees a trail of gas leaving the gas station so what's he, what do you what do you think he's gonna do well he's gonna pursue this now the knife salesman has a head start but he's leaking gas and eventually he runs out of gas and stops on the highway next to this large truck this gas truck that we saw at the very beginning of the movie it was like in the opening credits you didn't know what was going on it just looked like a truck that had like fallen over you didn't really get the significance until now the knife salesman pulls over he's out of gas wouldn't you know it? This is the gas truck that they've all been waiting for. It seems like that truck had fallen over, uh, it had crashed, the driver was dead. That's why there was no gas. That's why this whole situation kind of happened. A nice salesman is just trying to like leave, trying to figure out what to do. And as he's pulling away, trying to get a better view, he sees the sheriff approaching. The sheriff is approaching, he's following the trail of gas, and he sees the car on the side of the road. He recognized the car because the car was there when he got there. When he dropped his wife off at the very start because the knife salesman was the first person to show up so he sees the car pulls over sees the knife salesman and he thinks that the knife salesman killed his wife not an illogical assumption i mean that, that is a logical assumption so he's going for blood he's going to go kill the knife salesman the knife salesman like i didn't do it i didn't do it but the sheriff isn't hearing any, any of it and the knife salesman also wants to keep the money he realizes if he gets caught with the money he's going to be blamed anyways like it's going to seem like he killed everyone for the money I mean, not again, not an unreasonable assumption. So he's hiding behind the gas truck. The sheriff comes and starts, you know, like shooting at him, doesn't hit him. And the knife salesman decides that he's going to like go all out in a blaze of glory. So he takes a lighter, starts the lighter, throws it on some of the gas that was leaking from the gas truck. When the gas truck, you know, crashed, it seems like some of the gas was leaking. So he throws that there. He starts running. The sheriff starts taking some pot shots as he's running. The sheriff hits the knife salesman like in the stomach, essentially, like from behind. Before the flame hits the gas truck and blows up, blows the gas truck up. The sheriff, who was right next to the gas truck, he also gets blown up. So that threat is averted, but the knife salesman has now killed four people, I think. And he is shot in the stomach. So he tries to keep moving, but he's bleeding profusely. And he like is trying to keep moving, carrying the uh, the bag of money. He collapses over, falls on this money, and he is probably going to bleed out here. And and that, that was like that's like the ultimate tragedy in this movie, right? You've got this horrible situation. You have a generally good person who now like is going to bad, extreme bad things to get this money that he didn't want in the first place. But then when the opportunity came up, he's like, you know what? Maybe I will take that money. And then he has to do all these horrible things to kind of like enforce that decision. And now he's going to die with that money and no one's going to know what else happened. So he's probably going to be remembered as like a mass murderer, 
who tried to steal this money, killed some people, killed a sheriff. He's not going to be looked at well because of this decision. And that is like the ultimate tragedy. And this is like, everyone died. The money didn't go to anyone. And this nice salesman, you know, ruined his reputation, ruined the lives of all these people because he got greedy and because everyone else got greedy too. He also died alone in the desert when he was really excited to go back and see his daughter uh, for her birthday. So, you know, there's a lot of tragedy in this ending and it is so painful, but also like so well done. So that is it. That is everything. It seems like the last stop in Yuma County is now essentially like a ghost town because it seems like everyone in Yuma County is dead. And, but I guess they cop the bank robbers so that's good well they, they, they punished the bank robbers so that's good right well that is the last stop in yuma county uh and i guess there's two more people there's barbara crampton she survived and the uh the the young deputy so they are now the new people in yuma county so but that is the last stop in yuma county like i said it comes to theaters on may 10th 2024 i definitely think you should check it out i really enjoyed it, it has a fantastic cast really great style and you know plenty of drama and really good writing i didn't mention the writing but the, the writing is good it's very very good conversation i mean the movie is mostly conversation and so you have a lot of really good conversation in that diner so definitely check it out when it comes to theaters and if you do check it out let me know what you think let me know what you liked and didn't like let me know what got right and wrong i would love to hear it and uh thanks so much for watching if you like this review please like and subscribe to this channel it helps me out a lot make sure all my new content goes straight to you thank you well they are understandably just mistrust they are understandably um they are understand they are understandably concerned